All right, both are on. Is your audacity started? Yep, we just started. Okay. Clap on three. Off. All right. One, two, three. Okay. Um, welcome back to yet another episode of Boundary Spanners with me, Abby, and my co-host and friend, Nate, where this season, we are exploring solutions to residential electrification in the United States of America and Canada across the boundaries of policy, technology, research, implementation, HVAC business models, culture, policy, politics, everything. Nate and I have experience in white broadly speaking, white collar world, broadly speaking, blue collar world. And we're trying to sketch out common ground and explore solutions together. Now, this episode is a follow-up to a previous episode we did titled The Four Horsemen of the HVACalypse. So these are four large selection pressures, existential challenges that are keeping HVAC industry um, workers, men and women and owners up at night. And these four challenges are bearing a significant pressure on the industry uh, to change how it operates right now and it manifests in how the industry operates right now. And the four horsemen of the HVAC ellipse are skills shortage, commoditization or commodification of HVAC, business model whiplash uh, for HVAC contractors and owners, and a broader cultural decline in workmanship. Now, if you wanna dive deeper into what each of these means and what taken together, how this is affecting the HVAC industry and why this, you know, about, you know, why this is a problem for the industry as it is, I would suggest people go back and listen to the previous episode. What this episode is doing is given that these are four significant challenges that the industry is facing, what happens when you layer on policies, regulations, incentives, pressure to decarbonize on top of each of these existing challenges? How will the industry, how is the industry likely to respond? How is the industry already responding? How, how much does it help or hinder the problems that the industry is already facing? And then we will talk about for each of these uh, um, horsemen of the hvac what pathway that you and I see, Nate, um, through our years of experience in this industry uh, from you know, all aspects, what is that narrow pathway to success we see in navigating these four challenges for the industry with decarbonization layer on top. Sound good? That sounds like a plan, Abby. Let's get going. Okay, so first horseman of the hvac is um, skills shortage. So we're not just talking about quantity of HVAC contractors, but we're also talking about the range of skills that is called upon HVAC contractors to be successful in the industry. So it's a combination of plumbing, refrigeration, electrification um, uh, of electrical uh, systems. Um, carpentry. Carpentry, sheet metal. So it's a combination of these skills and trade just to be technically proficient. But then in order to run a successful business, you need a sales process, you need marketing, uh, you need a strategy for expanding growth and on all of these things. And so there's- a, Operations, yeah. Operations um, and so on. And so the industry is broadly experiencing uh, a shortage of skills. And now what happens, both in terms of number of people and, and the skills of people and the ability to upgrade and upskill uh, technically proficient people on other aspects of growing a business and so on. So what happens when we layer on decarbonization on top of this? <laughs> um, have you ever watched a train wreck? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, there, 
So I, we should probably take a step back. Um, and for starters, I'm just going to recommend a, a, anyone who's listening. I, I spent about six weeks putting together um, the Electrify Everything course. Please go take that because it digs into the technical challenges and then also the marketing challenges of electrification. And so a lot of what we're talking about will make much more sense after you listen to and, and watch the videos there. Um, and this, but, if I can interrupt for just a moment, this course is sure. for homeowners? Oh, yes. Yes. I aimed it at homeowners. And I, I, I basically had a California policy wonk in mind, uh, like as I was doing it. So uh, who it. is also a homeowner. Um, uh, but uh, so in a, in a mild climate, electrification isn't that big of a deal. You can oftentimes just pull out a furnace, put in a heat pump and uh, get away with it. Um, it's helpful to do some math and th there's definitely some sales and marketing, you know, the, some consumer education things that need to happen. But when you get into the colder climates, which uh, so nine US states out of 50 use half of the natural gas in the country. Wow. And that's just natural gas. Now you, you look at the Northeast and they use a bunch of fuel oil. So that's a whole nother challenge. Uh, that one though is actually easier to a degree because fuel oil is pretty expensive to heat with. Uh, but natural gas is the really challenging one because it's so cheap and it's cheap to operate. Uh, and at the moment, so at, at the moment. Yeah, exactly. Futures have doubled here in the last month or so. Uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. That's probably going to flip the math, but um if you have a cold climate house and you pull out a furnace and you put in a heat pump willy nilly, um, there's a couple of bad things that could happen. If you don't have adequate ductwork, um, it will run high pressures inside the system and you could eat motors inside two years. Like we're seeing that already. There is the, the Department of Energy mandate here. Uh, it wasn't it, they didn't mandate ECMs, but it's it's like saying you have to get 50 miles per gallon. And so all the pickup trucks, uh, you, you can't do it. There's no way. Um, so it, it made it so you you can't use the old kind of motors that were used. And those ones were darn near bulletproof. You could do almost anything to them and they'd survive. The new ones are pretty particular. So if you just slam something in, and it, particularly if you size it to where it probably should be, most homes only have about three tons worth of ductwork. So um, kind of using a piece of jargon here, but uh, three ton air conditioners, 36,000 BTUs, that's the most common size on the market. And a three ton heat pump is also basically that. Most houses have somewhere between two and three tons worth of duct ductwork. So they can flow 800 to 1200 cubic feet per minute of air. Um, if you put a four ton heat pump on there, which would probably be appropriate for a lot of houses, particularly when they're a bit leakier, but you only have two tons of ductwork, you're going to run insane pressures inside and you could destroy that system inside five years. And it was expensive. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's highly unlikely it will last a decade if you do that. Um, and it's pretty likely that it will die within five years. This is a $15,000 install that you just destroyed. Um, is that going to cause problems in the market? Do you think people are going to complain over that? Uh, I mean, this is going to feel like diesels in the 80s. Like I talked about one of the earlier episodes, my dad bought a Chevy pickup that had the really crappy, crappily engineered diesel that they put out in the early 80s. And he talked about pulling that motor out and dropping it on the driveway of the executive who approved the project. I mean, he hated it. I mean, it was awful. I mean, uh, he restored cars and thankfully he wasn't driving it or he, he might have actually done something violent. Um, but uh, they towed a car to Pebble Beach in California and going over the pass, it was going 12 miles an hour floored on the interstate. Um, it would only go about 50 on the flat with the trailer behind it. Um, the, the minivan that I have right now has more than double the horsepower of that engine, um, and similar torque. So I, I did a better job. I, I, we, we went to Pebble beach last fall, um, and, uh, it, pulling it over the hill, it, it, that that's what it was. But, um, if we aren't careful, we are going to create eighties diesels experiences for everyone involved. And if you don't pay attention to electrifying a house and how you do it, is it tight enough? Um, what is the actual heat load? 
Do you have enough ductwork? Can you make modifications to that ductwork easily that let it flow more? Um, if you don't work through these problems carefully and methodically, the odds of failure and um, creating bad stories are really high. I mean, in the spray foam industry, there, there's a video that has a three jillion views where um, the foam was mixed badly as it was sprayed against the roof. And the closed cell foam, there's no easy way to get it off. And it, it turned into a lawsuit and this whole video on it. And they ended up cutting the whole roof structure off the house, taking it off and rebuilding a new roof structure and then foaming it again. Oh. Um, that video has millions of views. Was that bad for the spray foam industry? Yeah. What if we create a whole bunch of stories like that? If we don't educate people, well, so contractors need to have the skills to do this and they're relatively high level skills, although they're not really, I mean, so relating back to HVAC 2.0, the program that we're building, the way that we view it to a large degree is that if we can break the process down to where 80% of it can be done by entry-level talents, it's going to be kind of like McDonald's. You can go anywhere in the world. And I mean, McDonald's is like getting the same supply everywhere. It's going to be no fun, but McDonald's has it figured out. So it's like, it's the same mix of beef. It's the same type of onion. Um, it's the same uh, buns, you know, at, it, anywhere in the world, a Big Mac tastes like a Big Mac, um, which is pretty remarkable. And it's assembled by kids making minimum wage, basically, of whatever that country happens to be. Um, it's a fairly complex process to do that. And they do it quickly. I mean, they're, they're trying to get um, cars out of the window in 60 or 90 seconds. Yeah. Um, so we, we need a process wrapped around this because if we aren't really careful in how we apply this technology, so heat pumps, to be clear, applied correctly, are vastly superior to furnaces. They deliver much better comfort experiences um, because they're always putting out a little bit of heat or a little bit of cool. And I'm talking variable speed, um, inverter driven equipment, not single stage or two stage because those, those don't provide the best experiences. Um, they're, they're okay. But um, if you hear a bad story about a heat pump, pretty much guarantee you it was single stage and it was oversized. Um, so that's, that's usually what, and usually poorly commissioned. So that's a whole nother piece of the puzzle. So uh, if you use them correctly, they're, they're always putting out a little bit of heat, a little bit of cool. You can use them to do good filtration, which knocks a lot of garbage out of the air. Like there's just an article that um, uh, COVID rates in wildfire areas are higher. And it's because people's um, defenses are lower because they're breathing in all this crap and their body's having to deal with all this poison and it makes it easier to get sick. So good filtration is really key. So, and you can do that with a system and it's nice when it's, it's not just blowing and blowing cold air uh, or well, the room temperature air, it's blowing warmed or cooled air depending on the season. So the experience can be nothing short of spectacular. Um, but if you apply it incorrectly, you're asking for a train wreck. You're asking for my dad being furious, ready to pull the motor out. Um, and we have to be really, really cautious to do that. And the way to do that is a solid process. It's, it's a checklist. Um, so I, mean, I just read the book, The Checklist Manif Manifesto about a month ago, and it, it, it really flipped my world inside out. So it was, it, it was, I read it when I really needed to read it. I needed what was in that book right now. Um, and what it talks about is checklists aren't there because you're stupid. They're actually there because you're smart. So they, they reduce the risk of simple but critical failures. Uh, so the, the doctor who wrote that, Atul Gawande, um, he helped write a checklist for the WHO, which applies to all operations. The first item in the checklist is, is this the right patient? <laughs> um, and what are you doing? Uh, and is the place that you are going to be operating on marked? Um, so there, it was just simple stuff like you should do that, but it's an easy thing to get missed in the mix of things. So the, the checklists are meant to help prevent you from making easy, stupid mistakes. 
so that you can concentrate on all the really difficult stuff that that makes it awesome. Um, or a great way he put it is in the intensive care unit, if, uh, if you can't hold the odds of harm down enough, the odds of good can't prevail. And that is heavily a process thing in our experience with electrification. So, I mean, when, when it comes to electrifications, there, there's, there's a few people that have done more than us, but I don't know that anybody's done them in a cold climate outside of programs. Okay. Everybody so else me... has thousands of dollars thrown at them. So. Makes sense. So let me see if I'm understanding this right. I'll try to summarize your argument, right? So an industry that is facing an acute skill shortage, mm -hmm. If we ask them to do decarbonization on top of the existing challenge that they already have in trying to hire, retain, train, retrain, and upskill their workforce, then layering on decarbonization on top is actually going to make these problems even worse. So one way of mitigating that perhaps might, a secret to mitigating that might lie in maybe demystifying the, the, so we cannot rely on the flamboyance of a few artists to be able to deliver McDonald's at scale. You need a process, right. you know, I, I mean, yes, a boutique, you know, a burger joint, you know, on a corner of your street, you know, they, they might have a, a guy who does it, you know, or a guy or a girl who does it very particular, in a particular style, mm -hmm. but just relying on individual skills and individual abilities to decarbonize, we won't be able to deliver at scale. So in order to deliver at scale, we, what we need to do is to have a process that kind of like, it, it, it takes strips out all, it takes out all the tacit knowledge and renders it explicit through a process. Yes. Yep. A process that at least 80% of the workforce can follow. They may not be highly, uh, their skills might not be diversified. So we don't need everyone who has a, who has the ability to do marketing and sales and, and, and plumbing and electrical and blah, 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 and all of these things and insulation and all of that. But we need it enough to where people who 80% of the workforce, if they're doing one thing, they do that proficiently well. So we need a process. We need to wrap decarbonization around a process uh, around which you can hang a hat on and it can scale. And 80% of that can be done through process and almost like a checklist kind of thing. Yep. Which leads us into the second one, actually. So we have commoditization and commodification. So commoditization is, um, it's, it's the natural thing that happens in industries that uh, you take things that are disparate and uh, distinct and oftentimes, you know, bespoke and custom, and you, you turn them into commodities or products turn into commodities. And particularly when we, we don't have knowledge about any kind uh, about a space, we typically don't understand the differences that are there. Like I use the example of paint. Cheap paint is not worth using. Um, buy more expensive paint. You will thank yourself for it. Um, I mean, my my in-laws. So my, uh, I love my in-laws dearly. So first, let me say that. Um, oh, they're but, not listening to this anyway. Uh, no, they're, they're never going to listen to this one. So there's frugal, there's cheap, and then somewhere two miles over that way is my in-laws. Um, like it is amazing how they like they they can squeeze blood from a stone. They're just amazing, and uh, I mean they've done they've done such a great job. Um, they've never made a huge amount of money, but they have retired comfortably. Um, and, and, you know, they, they own their house outright. They own the 16 acres that they're on outright. Um, and you know, they're, they're just awesome people. Uh, but they buy expensive paint. <laughs> it's like the only thing they buy that's expensive. So if you don't understand, um, a market that you're jumping into, you think it's all the same. And like we discussed in a previous episode of own five houses, um, I've only replaced HVAC in one. I replaced a furnace in one. We're about to do one here, but it hasn't been done yet. Uh, so most people don't understand that there's a range of products out there. They don't understand the good, better, best. And so if somebody comes in telling you about more expensive stuff, your natural reaction is to be pushback. You're just trying to sell me something. Um, and so we need to decommodify HVAC. Because when it comes to cold climate HVAC, we have to go high end in cold climate. The cold climate heat pumps are not the cheap ones. They're the expensive ones, pretty much always. Um, there are exceptions, but 
we're, we're not going to run the crappy stuff. We just aren't. And so we need to build the value from that cheap stuff to the good stuff. There needs to be a reason to cover that. And to get a good install, there needs to be more value on top of that. And then there needs to be profit margin on top of that. Um, uh, and overhead and all of these other things. So uh, we need to be able to pretty substantially jump the cost of these jobs and still have people buy them, which is tricky. So that's that's the decommoditization. Now, the commodification is creating a process, uh, creating McDonald's of decarbonization. So we need to have a process that's very step-by-step -step and careful. And it, it's, it's a checklist from the checklist manifesto. It's like, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? All right. So that removes half the risk from the system by doing those. Um, now we can address the other smaller pieces of risk that are very custom to that particular project, to that particular client, and to that particular budget. Um, and if we can do that with largely entry-level talents, we also help deal with a lot of the skills shortage and uh, we can train more people up. This, this gives the newbies something they can go do. And like we've designed the comfort consult in HVAC 2.0. Um, it has three requirements. You need to be decent with other human beings. You need to know how to run a blower door, which if you're mechanical at all, you can learn in a few hours. And um, you need to be able to follow a script. That's it. And that's why we designed it that way, so that it is kind of a McDonald's of decarbonization. And what that does, that collects a blower door, which is how much a house leaks, which is um, once you get a house reasonably well insulated, air leakage rules what it takes to heat and cool that house. So you, if you don't understand that piece, you're you're missing a huge part of the equation. Um, you know, it's a. I mean, without blower door, what we've found is. I can swing a load calculation plus or minus 70%. That is no longer a calculation. That is a guess. And it's not even a good guess. Um, and it, it really is as wide as that. Like not always, but the colder the climate you get, the, the wider the variance can be if you don't understand air leakage. Um, so if we don't collect air leakage, we don't know. And if we can get past to energy use, that really helps inform that sort of thing. And then as far as building value, we need to ask the client, what bothers you about the house that you would like to fix? And once you ask that, okay, how much does it bother you? Let's rank it on a scale of one to 10. And then once we pull all those together, what would it be worth to make all those problems go away? Now we just increase the value drastically on that project. And we solve the problem that I had with my insulation business, which is that most people for just insulation are looking at, uh, well, so I'm going to be good to the earth. Um, so I'm willing to spend up to $2,000 to be good to the earth. Um, laser beams. Um, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm doing air quotes. So I'm totally feeling like Dr. Evil right there. Um, uh, although that would be one too, like $1 million. Uh, like that's, we, we, we need to develop value in homeowners as we were talking about in a previous episode. They need to be willing to write the check to do the project. Um, that's key. And doing that because everything here is more expensive. You know, the HVAC is going to be more expensive if they need to do the shell work to tighten and insulate the house. Um, I, there's a conversation that I'm in right now in LinkedIn where somebody's like, well, we can just do it like weatherization. No, you can't. You have to diagnose it. Um, you, you need higher margins to be able to make that stuff work. Those methods are the cheapest possible methods, which usually means they aren't good. Um, uh, like the, the reductions that can happen, the air leakage reductions that can happen in weatherization jobs often leave a lot to be desired. Um, and we just discussed how air leakage is like the key driver of what it takes to heat and cool a house. So the more you can drive air leakage down, the more you can drive uh, the size of the equipment down. And because most houses only have two or three tons worth of ductwork, if you can't get it into that range, you can't electrify it easily. And if you aren't careful, like you can put a three ton heat pump in a six ton house, they're going to get a thousand dollar electric bill in January, maybe 1500. Right. And like, so if we're trying to be gentle on low income people, do you want to give them an electricity bill that's, you know, half or uh, more than half what their annual should be? 
No, that's, that's how we make people lose houses. Uh, so there needs to be a process to reducing the risk of electrifying homes. And so the, the process that you're talking about is the, is being able to sell a decarbonization as a commodity. So yes. right now you, you touched upon this in a previous. Or as episode. a service, maybe I should say as a service rather than as a, a service. Commodity. Yeah. yeah. So in a previous episode, we talked about how like in the ground zero of decarbonization, which residential decarbonization, at least, which would be mm. in America is Berkeley, right? I think you said, or yeah, well, Bay area in general, Bay area, right. San Francisco, Oakland. Yeah. yeah Berkeley. The, even there, a lot of homeowners who might express an interest in uh, decarbonization cannot get that as a bundle or a package. If they go talk to an HVAC contractor, they'll say, you know, HVAC contractors are there to sell HVAC equipment and they haven't really evolved a business process through which they can sell decarbonization as a service. What you're suggesting is because HVAC contractors already have the inroads into households, and we yep. talked about uh, one of our earlier episodes, we talked about how the road to decarbonization and actually even the road to locking in carbonization of households through residential heat and residential water heating yep. goes through HVAC, HVAC contractors. contractors. Yep. The HVAC industry, so developing a, and, and pivoting the HVAC industry into more of a consultative service where they're selling decarbonization as a service would require the HVAC industry, it's not just a skills gap in terms of being able to do good HVAC, like going to a college or going to a training program on doing uh, HVAC thing. That's only one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. The other piece of the puzzle is trying to understand the, the needs of the house. So doing a blow door test, trying to understand the, uh, the, the airflow intensity, or I'm, I'm gonna, sorry, I'm blanking on the technical term, but so just to see how leaky the house is and being able mm -hmm. to diagnose Issues with the house, like the moisture, condensation, musty, musky smells, or you know, like my my bedroom is warm while my living room is cold. Like the, being able to diagnose the needs to the house, yeah. Trying to understand the priorities of the homeowner. So maybe the homeowner and says, that, "Well, actually, my biggest pain point is the fact that my windows, you know, get moisture every time I turn the the heating on, or something like that." And, and to be able to, the service that you're talking about is to be able to commodify and, and identify a project that lies in the sweet spot between what the home needs based on the home inspection that an HVAC contractor does. We're not talking about quick scale energy audit, but just like a walkthrough and a blower door test to understand like what the needs of the house is getting the homeowner to express what their priorities are because a lot of their problems will not be solved by just like switching an equipment for like for like you take a furnace out you put an HVAC uh, you know a heat pump in maybe their comfort issues might not be solved because there's zonal issues right there's you know heating in a, the house is leaking yeah house is leaking and then and then there's actually the the technical skills of being able to fit in an HVAC system and and having all these things work together so that's the the skills cap, and that's also the the commodification piece you're talking about. So helping yep. contractors develop a model through which they can identify and deliver pro projects at the sweet spot of what the house needs, what the homeowner prioritizes, and what and the, the equipment that they need. So at this point, once you once you've solved for comfort for the homeowner, you've taken you you you've identified projects that will meet their priorities. You've diagnosed the problem with the house so you can right size the equipment. Mm -hmm. At this point, the homeowner, I, I'm, you correct me if I'm wrong, but a vast majority of them, they don't particularly care if it's a heat pump or a furnace, right? So at this point, you're, you're solving their priorities, you're, you're helping them fix comfort issues in their house. And so you're decarbonizing almost like surreptitiously. You're selling decarb yeah. without selling decarb. Does that sound about right? Can you That's expand exactly on that? It. Yeah, it's uh, um, it, <laughs> it, it, it's like getting kids to eat vegetables by putting veggies on pizza, um, or uh, it, me, but... sometimes you don't notice that. Well, it can actually make pizza better. Um, but we we put peas in mac and cheese. 
which our daughter doesn't really love, but we do it anyway. Like, you shut up and eat it. Uh, but it, the ideal thing is, yes, we want to sneak in. So in so much of our work, we found that if you make something an explicit goal, you fail. If you build a system in that what you want is a natural outcome, you win. And decarbonization, people who say they care about decarbonization, when you put the price tag in front of them, they don't do it. Like there are exceptions, but I, I've, I, I wrote an article years ago called I'm, uh, I'm calling BS on Greenies because mm. I had had five separate people in five different in instances. And this was uh, 2016 um, say they wanted it. And then when we got there, they wouldn't pay. And I'm like, it is what it is. This is what you asked to do. It's going to cost this. It just is. Um, you know, like a, I, I want a brand new car, but I want to pay 10 grand. Well, I, I don't know what I can do for you. You know, it's, it is what it is. Or I want a brand new Mercedes, but I only have 20. Um, your, your experience is not unique in that respect. Because you, you talk to any contractor, um, mm -hmm. And every, every contractor has got a story about how someone's walked in and they've expressed their green credentials and the green priorities. And then, and then you show them, you know, you budget them out to them. And then, then the gulf is not too different, right? Between a project that is more green for the environment and, and a project that's, yeah. but the gulf might be even a thousand, two thousand dollars, but even that gulf is too big. Even for, everyone's got a story. Like I said, like the only green that matters is the color of my money, right? At the end of the day for a lot of people, including people who, talk the big talk about being green. I think where your experience is even more prominent is that I think you, because of the nature of your uh, presence in a white collar community, I think you may have interacted with people who are extremely more vocal and have a large audience on decarbonization, but are not willing to put money where they do mouth not is. walk the walk. Um, and it, damn, that pisses me off. Um, yep. Like that's it, so now I've gotten to the point when somebody says that's important to them, I beat the crap out of them on budget. Okay, what's it worth? Nope, that's not enough. What's it really worth? Nope, that's not enough. Okay, you can't do anything. You don't actually care about this. $25 a month, that's not a problem. Um, you're an idiot. Um, like you can't solve climate change for 25 bucks a month. Um, not going to happen. Uh, so yeah, that, that stuff just ends up driving me bonkers, which means it... it if people with green intentions are not willing to spend the money to solve this, what about people without? And that's where, yeah, you have to sneak it in. So this is all about experiences. I mean, the, the prime directive in our work is to provide excellent experiences for both contractors and homeowners. And doing both of those simultaneously is extremely difficult. Um, so that's like walking along a ridge where if you go six inches either way, you fall off um, and you die because it's a long way down. Um, this is an extremely narrow path to figure this out. But we, we have to find a repeatable way to make Big Macs the same from whatever contractor you buy it from. Um, but the curse is all the Big Macs are, um, they're customized. So one, some have one pickle, some have four, some have no pickles, some are without the special sauce. Um, you know, some aren't a Big Mac, it's actually fries. You know, <laughs> it, um, it, everything is custom. Every single solution to a home is bespoke. So if you and I owned the same house, the solution set between what your goals are, uh, what the house needs and what your budget is would be different from mine. So the projects would look somewhat different. It, it, they'd probably be close, but they'd have tweaks and they may look really different. Um, like if you're planning on living in a place for 10 years, that's going to be different from, yeah, it's the only time I'm going to leave this place is, uh, heels first, um, in a body bag. So, uh, um, uh, th th those leave, are all different solutions. There's a, there's a song, uh, Snoop Dogg and Eminem song, I guess I'll leave in a body bag, but never in cuffs. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, there you go. Yeah. So, so yeah. So. Um, to circle back uh, to uh, to commodifying and, and being able to mark, so you're, you're selling decarbonization without marketing decarbonization, right? Exactly. And one of my favorite papers on retrofits or energy efficiency is a paper in uh, the ACEEE, 
It's about the, this, this fantastic, I'll find it and we'll link it in the show notes, uh, but it talks about how Tide, Tide, the laundry product, sells Tide and doesn't sell Tide. So the idea is, you know, we in, in the decarbonization industry, we sell decarbonization based on things that we value, which is decarbonizing, but not based on what our consumer values, which is comfort, uh, cleaner in, cleaner air quality and things like that. And whereas Tide, you know, do you think the executives at Procter & Gamble, this I'm, I'm riffing off the paper, but this is what the paper says. Do you think the executives at, the, at Procter & Gamble care about having more clean clothes in the world, have a, care about more whitey whites in the world? They don't, they wanna make more money, they just wanna sell more product. Yeah. But they don't market their Tide on being able to sell more product, right? Being able to clean more clothes. They market it on like, you know, what people want, which is like clothing miracles. They want white or whites. They want laundry time to be less. They want, they want, people want to smell laundry and dance. And this is the imagery that the ad shows. It doesn't talk about what, and so the rest of the industry has figured this out. The rest of the industry has figured out that you can't just say nine out of 10 dentists recommend. We've stopped doing that in, in the advertising space. You know, yeah. what we what we sell is what people value, which is, you know, like that the wanting to feel, wanting to dance. And yet when it comes to decarbonization, I think maybe because culturally we're locked in to spending time around people who feel like us. So we feel like we have to market decarbonization or decarbonizing. Whereas if you actually market your service as something that helps you get to your goals, help you solve your problem with your home, helps you diagnose your issue and right size your heating and cooling equipment. Mm -hmm. And just happens to be done with the heat pump. Just happens to be done with the heat pump. Just like, That's how we you know, your, your whitey whites are happen to be done with the tide. Do you really care if it says tide or bite or right? As long as you look at the ad and it, you know, and it like, it looks good. Betty White is out there <laughs> selling. <laughs> I love that. You know, clean, clean <laughs> what a hilarious spokesperson. Um, yeah. So what we're getting into here is it's a separate topic, but I want to at least touch on it. Um, we are talking about the bell curve of adoption. So the adoption curve. So it looks like a bell curve. The, the first 16% are your early adopters. That's your early market. The very early people are the innovators. They like to get stuff because it is brand spanking new. Doesn't mean it works. Doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's better. It's just new. Um, that's it. You had me at new. Um, that's that group. Um, and then the next bunch, the early adopters want to have stuff before their friends. Um, but once you get beyond those, like you can sell them in perfect products that don't necessarily work as advertised, but until you create a product that is substantially and demonstrably better than the alternative, you won't cross the chasm, um, into the fat part of the bell curve. So the, the, the first uh, standard deviation, 16%, the next one's 34, the next one's 34. So that 70% of the market, that's what you want. That's where things happen. But if you don't create a complete product that is demonstrably better than what the old one was, you will never cross the chasm and actually scale. So what you see is the same thing that we were talking about the curve last time of programs, where it's the bell cliff. So it, it comes up. Um, it's like, oh, look, we're actually making things move. And then the program ends and boom, um, it does a wily e. coyote off the other side of the, the, the cliff. And you just hurt progress. It would be better to find a way to create a nice, smooth, upward curve that's geometric and never stop. Like we, we can't have pauses. The, the time for this is over. I mean, we've been saying for a while now, like case studies and pilots, that time's <laughs> over. It's time to move. Um, and if you think otherwise, you are in the way. Yeah. And so be ready for me to turn the volume up on you and make your ears bleed because you're actually hurting progress at that point. The amount of case studies we still seem to be want to do and, you know, amount of budget that goes out for doing one-off case studies irritates me. And then yeah. once you get past the case studies, we're still caught in the bottleneck of we need to improve training at community colleges and stuff like that. But even that is still a very small part of the puzzle. Right. The yeah, larger yeah. part is like commodifying and, and turning decarbonization into a package that contractors can reliably and profitably sell at scale. 
Yes. And the, and the early steps need to be able to be done by entry level talent because that's what we have to work with. We're going to need to be training kids. Um, and besides when it comes, so the bedrock of decarbonization is building science. It's the physics of how houses actually work. It's applied physics. Um, and understanding that it's not necessarily that complicated, but if you don't have a process to go through, you're, you're going to have all kinds of weird things that happen. Um, like I said, the house could be too leaky. You don't have enough duct work. Um, you might be short on ducts to some rooms where the, the load there is higher. Um, like there's all these technical problems that can happen, but I mean, we designed the comfort consult, so you can pretty much, you know, if you spend four hours with a kid training them how to use a blower door, you can send them out and they can collect the information that they need. Will they do the best job? No, but they'll do a passable one. Um, and that's what we need is a way to take that building science and um, commodify it enough that we can have fairly inexperienced people successfully wield it. Got it. Um, and so that, that's, that's a key piece of this, but that is not so much technical training in doing that. Um, the, the technical training is important, but when it comes to HVAC, most people are at least halfway decently trained. Um, I mean, the, it, to be able to do their job, they have to know some stuff. Yep. Um, so when we're like, oh, they need more stuff. Well, you can train them how to do something, but if they never sell a project that uses that skill, does that skill matter? Exactly. No. Yep. Um, it's the, you hear me say all the time, a, a treatment plan that's unexecuted with a dead patient is stupid for everyone. And if we do a whole lot of training on technical things that nobody uses, it's creating treatment plans with dead patients. Um, we, we, we don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's key. So the, in the commodification to reduce the risk and the, the risk here, we should probably dig into just a little bit more. Um, if you are an HVAC contractor and you haven't installed a heat pump before, um, and you've heard horror stories about it, how likely are you to push that on a homeowner? You're not. Um, I mean, maybe you'll do a hybrid, which is part of why we like hybrids, because it's it, it's a it's more than a toe in the water. You're you're half in. You you haven't jumped in, but you know you're up to your waist in the water of electrification. Um, that's that's an important piece. But if contractors are scared and nervous about callbacks, and they should be, um, if you don't do your homework on electrification, it ain't going to be good. Um, the system's going to break early. You're going to be doing a bunch of warranty work. You're going to have an unhappy client. You're going to have a bad review. Um, you know, God forbid you get something like that spray foam thing where they cut the top of the house off and just rebuilt it. Um, you know, I don't know what we do that would be exactly like that, but it could be ripping one out. I mean, my, my friend T. Gronis um, uh, bought an Energy Star home in Georgia that the system was so poorly designed and installed that his wife, who's a vet and had uh, <coughs> a bunch of vaccinations and things, um, she was exposed to all kinds of stuff um, in the Middle East. She's very environmentally sensitive. And that house made her sick because it was too damp, among other problems. Uh, that was a poorly, uh, that, that was a misapplied piece of equipment. It wasn't used well. And if we have many stories like that, this isn't going to scale. So the, what we're, ta what we're touching on here is <clears throat> in, in turning decarbonization into a comma, into a service mm -hmm. that contractors can reliably sell, the initial movement of this, the risk is borne largely by contractors who might have the technical chops, but don't know how to ring a business plan around it. And, and the risks of that are borne by the early homeowners and the contractors. And there really aren't many, it's not, you can't, you can't teach a kid how to ride a bike at a seminar. You can't teach a contractor how to build a, a successful business plan in selling decarbonization as a service through a training module. It's not like you can send them to college for two weeks and then they come back and they, so they need on, this is something experience that they have to build either by learning at the hands of someone mm -hmm. else who's done this successfully 
or through a, like a community of practice where they observe, uh, you know, some other folks doing this, they have to be onboarded it, onboarded along this to be able to do this responsibly, both for themselves and also doing this responsibly on behalf of their clients and homeowners. Mm -hmm. And there really aren't any spaces today, places where contractors can go to learn how to do this. Like I, as as a re, you know as a researcher as a policy person, for the longest time I have wanted to moonlight as a, a heat pump installer, and I've been trying and I have signed up to community college so I can learn that you know I can get my license to be an HVAC installer, but there really isn't a like a, there isn't a space where I can go nurture my skills and like be decarbonization oriented. I don't mm -hmm. know how I can you know create a business plan if I wanted to start. Not that I'm doing that right now of course but if i wanted to start mm -hmm. my own business quarterbacking as a decarb home decarbonization expert there really isn't any community i can go belong in and sit and learn i have to take all the risk upon myself and which is which is part of the challenge which is part of the need that you're addressing with your hvac2 community of practice is by helping people kind of navigate and this journey of self-discovery and sharing best practices among each other, right? Can you expand on that? Sure. Well, I mean, uh, all, the, our decarbonization actually goes back to my partner, Ted Kidd's mom's house. So what was it? 2010, 2011, something like that. Uh, she had some comfort issues in her house and uh, she needed a new HVAC system. So Ted was big on HVAC or was big on hybrid at that point. So he put in a top of the line heat pump on top of a top of the line furnace and being able to sell that to his mom is actually pretty remarkable because she's, she was frugal. Um, she's now passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, but, uh, she was a very frugal person. Um, but it, he ended up having her do a bunch of air sealing and fix the house, um, and solved a whole bunch of problems for her. And what actually one of the key ones, it's a little bit of an aside, but uh, her, her office was in the basement and spring and fall um, basements run cold, but there's no heat load upstairs. So the furnace doesn't run at all. So uh, with a nice system, when she turned the fan on medium, it mixed the house like a vinaigrette enough so that it made it comfortable for her to work downstairs spring and fall. Um, so that's one of those things, but you only get that from a very high end piece of equipment. Um, that has the, you know, three fan speeds or something like that. But in any case, so the, the decarbonization happened because she called him on a five degree day, which is design temperature. That's we spend 88 hours a year below design temperature or above design temperature in whatever climate you're in. It varies place by place, but five degrees is their thing. And she called and said, Teddy, um, the, it's fine. The house is still holding temperature, but the air coming out of the vents is really cold. And he thought, they didn't turn the gas valve on. It's running on the heat pump. Wow. Um, so that house never used a furnace <laughs> is what ended up happening. And he's like, why do we need a furnace? We, we can get rid of one piece of equipment. So, I mean, he's, he's a very technically minded, I mean, he's a Spurgeon. Um, so like, he's always trying to simplify and find different paths that other people don't see. And he was like, well, this is stupid. We'll just run heat pumps. And she happened to live in a town that had a muni. So they had a, a municipal utility. So they had very cheap electricity. Uh, so running the house on a heat pump made sense because it was like six cents a kilowatt hour. Um, just incredibly cheap. And uh, so he then figured that out and then started teaching me how to do it. And you want to talk about all the risk and the scary stuff. Yeah. That was 2014 for me. Um, we did a lot of stuff where I'm just like, Holy crap. I hope this works because I don't have the money to help fix it. I wasn't charging enough to even be, begin to be able to uh, fix a problem if there was a problem. Uh, but it worked because we had developed a system to reduce enough of the risk that we had pretty high certainty that good things were gonna happen on the other side of the project. Um, and so we have been working to turn that into a process. Because, uh, so one of the other important things I should say here is, I do not think there is any way to do de decarbonization from top down. You can't do this as an edict from above. Um, there's a great example actually that really helped me think through this in uh, the, the checklist manifesto. He talked a lot about uh, Hurricane Katrina 
hitting New Orleans back in 05. And I mean, FEMA got just raked through the coals because they did a terrible job uh, managing the crisis that they were supposed to manage. And who did a really good job? Walmart. And they didn't do a really good job um, uh, because Walmart had all these great policies in place. Uh, they, they did a good job because uh, Walmart, there was, there was almost no communication. Um, like it was really difficult to get phone calls or anything out. Uh, so Walmart just set goals of basically take care of people and try and keep track of what's going out the door as best you can. Uh, but there was decent communication um, of goals, and then they pushed all the decision making to the edges. Um, so if you think of centralized decision making as the center of a circle, they pushed that decision making as close to the edge of the circle as possible and empowered people to do it. And they did a really good job. So, I mean, it was very complex situation, very quick, quickly changing. They had no idea it was going to come on a truck. You know, there were all these things that were going on. And by decentralizing that uh, process as much as possible, Walmart actually kicked butt at getting stuff to people as they needed it. The, like they, they beat the pants off of the federal government, which was supposed to be doing that. Um, federal Energy, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, they killed FEMA. So decarbonization is in a lot of ways like a disaster where we need to deal with all of these disparate problems uh, it's like if you want to talk about the grid, it's every, this is all grid edge. We have to deal with everything at the edge. And you can't deal with that from the center. You can't say, you will do this and you will like it. Um, like there, there is none of that. Um, all we can do is set goals and try and set directions. But as soon as we begin to prescribe how anything is done, we destroy um, the result at the end by accident. Um, so there needs to be a process and goals, but we can't specify exactly how to do things. We need so, to decentralize. I mean, so the honest truth here is that uh, policymakers and governments need HVAC contractors in order to be able to deliver um, on HVAC two point, uh, deliver on climate and decarbonization goals. Correct. So at this point, we're trying to figure out what is the best way to get HVAC contractors engaged and involved in this effort, full-throated involvement, right? So yes. not just giving them a, like a couple of little carrots and, and dangling a couple of carrots and, and getting them to change the business plans, yep. but to support them where they are, help them grow their business, help them be more successful. Because when you actually do talk to contractors and you and I, uh, we wrote a blog post the other day. Um, we broke down a report from a, a large industry group that represents HVAC contractors here in Ontario, Canada. They did a study of their own contractors and, and to test their willingness and interest and capacity to participate in whole home energy retrofits for taking a leadership role in decarbonization and to understand their attitudes. And then what, the, and, and, and you know, we, again, this will be a whole other episode, but very quickly to summarize is that Contrary to what policymakers believe about HMI contractors, the blue collar workforce is actually interested and engaged and wants to take a leadership role in the industry, but they're really, this is my reflection on the report and I'd encourage everyone to read that report by themselves and we'll link it in the show notes. But what I took from that report is that many in the industry just want to engage in a journey of self-discovery by themselves, learn from their peers, learn from each other and, and, and to trust themselves to build this business model. There's for good reason, because they've been burned by programs in the past, because they've been burned by, like you were saying, top-down uh, programs in the past. They've, you know, they're, again, contrary to popular belief, they're not just ideologically skeptical about any kind of government intervention. Many contractors work successfully with a lot of government programs. It's just that, in order to take a leadership role on decarbonization, they want to in, engage in a journey of self-discovery, learn from within the industry, highlight examples of peers in the industry that are doing it well, and, and to kind of grow from there and to learn from each other and to build that like tacit knowledge base 
rather than have this top down program where you go get a couple like like there's some training in HVAC installation and all of a sudden now you can turn in for a few forty thousand fifty thousand dollar jobs on decarbonizing a whole home that's not how this is likely to happen you can throw money exactly. at colleges and universities it's not likely to happen unless uh, the men and women at the front lines of this are given the latitude and and the and 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 the rope and and the sort of bandwidth to be able to incorporate and develop a business model around selling decarbonization as a service. Yes. Uh, well, and I don't think decarbonization as a service is probably actually viable in the market. <laughs> um, uh, it, it would it, again that would be a natural outcome rather than a specific goal. Right. Um, and also, I want to highlight a cultural difference here because uh, it, it, I didn't really view the United States and Canada as drastically different culturally. Um, but the last few years, I've definitely seen a divergence. And in talking to you, I've seen a divergence. So uh, Canadians in general have a lot more trust in government, um, in my experience. And uh, in the U.S., that's not necessarily true. So if if you have a program telling, again, predominantly conservative, politically conservative contractors, 80%, give or take, are politically conservative, um, you know, it's, we've had really quite the split um, as far as ideologies here uh, in the last five or 10 years. So a lot of these contractors, if you talk about climate, they're going to be like, yep, I'm out. Here's another one of those stupid, you know, liberal agendas. I'm not going to do this. Fake news. Um, you know, we, we have to head that off at the pass. Um, and usually you do that by, well, A, finding goals that you can agree on. So um, who likes pollution? Put up your hand. Uh, oh, look, nobody. Um, so <laughs> we, we can reduce pollution. What's the single best way to reduce pollution uh, or air pollution? It's to burn less stuff. What's the solution to climate change? Burning less stuff. Um, so let's talk about pollution. Um, so now it's not a dog whistle. So what you're saying is that, you know, we touched upon this in a little more detail in the previous episode, but uh, the highlights of what you're saying is that you don't want HVAC decarbonization to be the next front on this ever-expanding sure. culture war. Yeah. You know, we, we're not, I mean, and in as much as we, each of us is a political entity onto ourselves, mm -hmm. we still don't want that to like that to be layered on top of this existing efforts. What we want is to contractors to do what they're good at because, you know, contractors are viewed by homeowners as like essentially like home energy doctors, right? They're, they, that's the role that they play. So what we, and we, we talked about the church at the kitchen table. So in order to be successful, rather than, double down on climate and decarbonization and these languages that might be the next front on the climate war and on the culture war. culture war. What we can do instead is to help HVAC contractors be more successful at what they're already doing. Yeah. Uh, helping them business. Business. Helping them I mean, business is not political. Uh, I mean business can be like people can use it to support things. No, but, but, uh, but at the end but, of the day, I mean, good business I, I mean, is good I, business. Everything is political, right? Like, yeah. yes. So, you know, the word business is political, but like when you look at the HVAC industry, every county in this country, in your country, in my country, has an HVAC installer. Most HVAC businesses are small family-owned businesses. Most of them employ less than 25 people. So these are, these are men and women and families who hold our communities up. These are the ones that go play pickup hockey, that donate to our communities, uh, you know, end up, you know, serving on the local boards. So these are men and women our, our, our friends and neighbors we're talking about here, right? So yeah. like, like, so what we want, I think a common goal that we can all hopefully al align towards, subscribe to us is that in order to do decarbonization well, it's not, let's not lead with decarbonization and then try to shoehorn HVAC contractors into this, mm -hmm. but rather center HVAC contractors, look at their, look at their, how their business in, uh, is structured, help them deliver HVAC as a service, not HVAC as a commodity, uh, or sorry, help them de de deliver home comfort and, and home uh, electrification as a service, 
and then use, you know, and, and then use that as a mechanism through which decarbonization actually happens. If you help HY contractors, if you support HY contractors going to people's homes, diagnose, doing blower door tests, helping identify the needs of the home, having them work, building that, like, you know, not messing with that fragile and, and friction filled relationship, the church at the kitchen table. Yeah. Help the homeowner articulate what their actual goals and priorities are. Help the contractor find projects that are in the overlap of what the homeowner wants, what the house needs, and what the equipment needs to be sized at. Well, then the budget. You, you, Don't forget the budget. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. So that's yeah. So that's yeah. So that the equipment size and budget is a part of the third piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. Now you have a business model through which decarbonization becomes natural, and yes. it's not. It's not a. It's, it's not a it's not a culture it's not in the forefront of culture wars it, it's not it's yeah. not something you even argue and debate about it's because it just you, happens it just happens because the homeowner is happy with their priorities you you have sized the system that meets their budgets meets their priorities and meets the need of their house and it just so happens that it it is a heat pump sound about right that is exactly right. Yeah. So it's it, it's uh, it's vegetables on pizza as opposed to peas and mac and cheese. Um, right. On. It, if you order mac and cheese and it shows up half vegetables um, and you're looking for comfort food and you bought it, you know, for 10 bucks at a, a restaurant, you're not happy. <laughs> um, but you know, if you're like, Ooh, yeah, you know, give me the Supreme pizza. So yeah, there's meat on there, but there's also a ton of veggies. Um, and then you're like, Oh, that's delightful. That's, that's what we want. And so that, that's what we want is to create Supreme pizza. Um, and that's, it, it's so critical. And well, that, that deals with the third horseman, uh, of the H vacalypse, H vacalypse, um, which is business model whiplash. So if yep. we are careful in how we design programs, and uh, like, like we said last time, it, any program, if you can't 1000x the program as it is, you shouldn't do it. Because otherwise, you're going to drive a little bit of an upslope, and then you're going to create that bell cliff. Um, so you get the bell curve going up and then a cliff. Um, we don't have time for the bell cliff anymore. We, we, we need a nice smooth you know, up and to the right, uh, as they say in, in business. Um, that's what we need to create. So we want to avoid business model whiplash as much as possible. So think about what you're doing. And so uh, I think next time we'll dig into some of what the, the possibilities are for that. But basically that does mean that the things that we do need to be free or nearly so, because otherwise, I mean, the rule of thumb in policy is beyond 1% penetration. Um, uh, incentives get too expensive, both literally and politically to continue. And 1% isn't going to do anything aside from, well, like the, the Dominion program in Cleveland where they brought in the energy auditors and they put all the private ones out of business. Um, and so now you can't really get stuff actually fixed. So they actually hurt the market rather than helping it. Um, also, they can create basically free ridership on HVAC. So they can get their awards, but they're just giving out 400 bucks to you know upgrade a one level uh, of efficiency in equipment. They're not really changing anything. And I don't know, I mean, free ridership is giving money to something that was going to happen anyway. Um, that program's basically free ridership at this point. Um, and that's a bummer. But if we want to actually decarbonize, we, we don't want free ridership. And uh, like we were saying, like business model whiplash, ideally we help support a business model that can do that up and to the right continuously without doing any cliffs, no, no bell cliffs. Um, and so we have to do that or it's going to be a problem. Um, and right now, all the stuff out there has done that. And then, I mean, also in the bad incentives category, which can be business model whiplash, uh, somebody just bought a heat pump uh, and, and electrified their house in Michigan. And there were rebates from the gas company and the electric company. And I forget exactly why, but they got neither <laughs> because the <laughs> programs are not designed to do what they did. Um, uh, so, oh, I think one of the, they, they couldn't get a rebate because it didn't say air conditioner. It said heat pump which God. is an air conditioner, but like, come on. Um, so there's all of these existing policies that are in place that are actually subtly getting in the way. So remove 
every bit of kitchen table policy that you can. Um, I mean, the, the one I have seen something that looked pretty interesting. Um, California is now basically mandating heat pumps for new construction, but uh, what they're doing is they're making it a little bit harder to install furnaces. And so they're kind of loading the, uh, the scale a little bit. And uh, I, I learned this in talking to Greg Hyman, who's one of the uh, HVAC 2.0 contractors. It, he doesn't like doing NOx furnaces. It's a low NOx um, nitrous oxide furnaces because they are super duper finicky and they're a lot more expensive and they have all of this, um, all these hoops they have to, to jump through for inspections and stuff, or they can just do a heat pump. Um, I'll take door number two. Um, <laughs> and so that can be a way to do it where you, you just lightly put pressure on the other side, but, it, but even that can be dangerous because who knows what else might come out of that. So like right now, that looks like a good idea, but do we discover in three years that that ends up, you know, having this weird perverse effect somewhere else? So how does HVAC 2.0, um, like what, what pathway does HVAC 2.0 lay out for contractors who are keen on developing a, like a resilient business model? Um, so, I mean, a lot of what it does is change them from a transactional focus to a consultative focus, which changes how that relationship works. So now you're talking about solving problems and if you can get people to open up about it and what their budget is, you're going to naturally land nicer jobs um, in a way that is not dishonest. Gotcha. Um, you know, it's, it's truly being a doctor for houses. But the, the last horseman, um, and I'm curious how, what you think on this, the cultural decline of workmanship. Um, what do you think that looks like in relationship to decarb? So from my vantage point, I think this culture, broader cultural decline of valuing workmanship is, um, is, is a more pervasive. It's like the, it's like the sea in which all these other problems are swimming as fish. So like the, not being able to value workmanship, workmanship not being valued as an essential life trait and skill. Uh, you talked about this earlier where, you know, auto mechanics are not as valued as, you know, some other, you know, white collar employment respected mm -hmm. in society. So that leads to a supply problem with, with lack of uh, skilled uh, shortage. Uh, Cultural decline, you know, feeds into, you know, like, uh, or, or lack being able to quantify a workmanship and, and, the, and, and the scale at which businesses have to grow to meet the decarbonization challenge means that workmanship may not be as valued as like some of the other skills and, you know, trying to make all this work. I think the, I think what happens when you layer on decarbonization on top of this is the fact that Doing any of this at scale means that we need to think very carefully about how we're balancing the priorities and the needs of the people who are whose lives and livelihoods are in the middle of this. Yeah. And what I mean is a lot of people, when, when I talk to a lot of HVAC contractors, they, they love what they do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's painful, it's hard work, uh, but being able to, you know, help, you know, keep families warm or cold as their needs might be, and being able to be there for people fills them with, with, with a sense of fulfillment. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in a way that I think is, is one of the underlying things that sustains the industry. Right. I mean, yes, you do get yeah. paid and, you know, all this sort of thing. But at the end of the day, people want to be seen as lovely, not just being paid, you know. So mm. you're not just trying to make an employment, but this is your career and it's also a lifestyle. And it's also where you find your community. Yeah. And so when decarbonization is not a defining feature of 
this entire industry, we need to think carefully about what happens to the dynamics of this place when we layer decarbonization on top, when we lay any sort of external, when goals come from external to the industry and you're asking the industry to respond to those goals and you're forcing, you're coercing the industry to respond to those goals yeah. by offering incentives, a stop start mm. incentives like we talked about or, or through regulation, then we need to be very mindful about the disruptive effect it can have on the livelihoods and the sense of purpose and, and the workmanship and the quality of life of people in the middle of this. So my reflection on this is that I would ask white collar uh, policymakers to spend quality time in, in the HVAC industry and space. And, and to center their programs and projects around what the industry is already doing so that these fundamental aspects of what makes this industry tick, which is you know, the way in which they value their work. I'm defining workmanship very broadly, right? Mm -hmm. People, a lot of people take pride in their work. Yep. And if you want them to decarbonize, we need to be decarbonization, taking pride in decarbonizing has to be as resilient, or sorry, it has to be as um, has to has to make your heart sing. If you're a, it has to make yeah. the you know a, a contractor's heart sing, not just their pockets ring, you know. <laughs> and and are, and when and and if you if you aren't taking what the blue collar workforce contractors are saying seriously, if you demonstrate a lack of understanding of their ethos and what drives them and what challenges they face every day then you're not going to get very far in making your programs work. And this is not, I'm not talking, even getting into uh, things like equity and, 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 and justice and all of these concepts, right? These, those are higher order concepts. I'm a stupid person. You know, I don't want to even get into that. But for me, fundamentally, if you want to be successful at your own goals, you have to be respectful of the communities that you want to engage with upon yes. whose backs you're building these programs, the success of these programs relies on. And you have to understand what they value and, and you have to sublimate your goals to what their goals are. You have to sublimate what your values are to what their values are. And, exactly. and, 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 and I don't see, I see very little evidence of this. I, I know that a lot, I mean, it's not for lack of, I mean, there's many people do genuinely care about, you know, from the, you know, policymakers care about the industry. They don't want to do no harm, it, you know, right? And so it's not like there are, you know, evil men and, you know, smoking in cigar filled rooms trying to destroy the industry. But at, at the same time, death. Right. No, don't, oh, that's the fifth fifth horseman of the apocalypse. Is the, <laughs> is the guys in the cigar filled rooms. But the the the, the fundamental uh, the underlying point here is that I see very little evidence of people doing this in practice. I've given this example before. You and I have received calls from tons of uh, uh, of cities around the United States, some in Canada, mm -hmm. who who'll say in effect they'll say you know we have a we have a bold decarbonization goal by 2030 you know we've got everything figured out all we need you to do nate and or abhi is to come in and just give this like three hour presentation on heat pumps and then our contractors will just we're inviting contractors we're giving Light them stuff up yeah. Yeah. We have the yeah. best we, contractors. We have um, the best contractors in the country. <laughs> you know, we, we're, very we're inviting them. very luxurious. <laughs> we are inviting them during their peak season, they, you know, to spend two days with us on a workshop. We're going to give them stale donuts and old coffee. We want you to come and give a presentation. And then after the end of which, now all of a sudden they're going to be on. So it, this is, it's a very paternal, patern, uh, paternalistic and patronizing yes. attitude uh, that yes. I think, I suspect a lot of uh, programs in effect end up having because they think that you can workshop your way out to decarbonization. You know, none of these working groups, I, I, very few, I should say, very few community energy plans and local energy plans are informed by the blue collar workforce in their communities. There's not even like an asset mapping does any has any does any city know how many HVAC uh, how many HVAC contractors they have? 
Does, do they know how many of them are doing are are able to do heat pumps? Do they know how many supply houses are able to? So they have very little knowledge of even like um, very little knowledge of just even superficial aspects of the 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 most powerful tool in their toolbox, which is HVAC contractors. I think a lot of policymakers have a very superficial understanding of how many people are in this industry in, within their own jurisdiction. I mean. Mm -hmm. what their profit margins are like what they're all the stuff that you and i are talking about like what you know, drives they, them yeah what drives them what motivates them and, and 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 what keeps them up at night and and if you if you're not in there and if you don't wholeheartedly sublimate your goals and to say i care about decarbonization but in order for me to get to my decarbonization goals i need to support the hvac industry in my community remain strong and resilient to these headwinds that are bearing down upon them and then in, by doing so, I want, you know, I want to enlist their support and their trust mm -hmm. so that together we can march forward and, and tackle decarbonization. I think, it, and we began talking about this through like a cultural decline of workmanship. That's a part of this, but a larger mm -hmm. part is the cultural winds that are blowing us apart, that blue collar and white collar communities are driving apart. And we have we have goals, but we don't understand each other. You know, our knowledge is constructed differently and our priorities are different. And what drives us different, the way we value success is different. The way we try take pride in our work is different. Um, so it, just, just giving incentives because HVAC contractors can make a, a couple more bucks during the two week years you run the program is not going to change the industry. It's not going to make people's hearts sing. So I this is a, this is a call to action for people who, uh, for policymakers who I, again, I can only speak to the, the world I inhabit mostly, which is the policymaker white collar world, uh, is to dive deep into the culture of your own community, the HVAC industry in your own community, mm -hmm. understand what their goals are, understand what their challenges are, and, and, and help them solve their problems. And together, then you can build the trust that you need in order to march forward. Yep. And, so, and, and and there's very little you and I can do about, honestly, right, about the broader culture of how do you stop people? How do you get people to care more about tinkering and fixing their own stuff? Those are things that we can do in our private lives with our kids, with people in our lives. And those are values that you can cultivate in yourself and in, in, the, in the lives of people that you can influence. But broadly in society, there's very little that we can do, I think, or it, it, it might not be the challenge. That might be very challenging to tackle is what happens mm -hmm. when when workmanship declines, but even as it declines, if, if you can demonstrate uh, an active willingness to support an industry and help them grow, I think you can enlist their support in, yeah. in championing what you and they identify as common priorities, if that makes sense. I, I love what you said there. Um, so I have two closing points. So what, one is, if you are a policymaker and you know a contractor, ask if you can go sit in the passenger seat for the day and just follow them around. Um, right along. See, see what they do. Yeah, do a ride along. Understand what their day looks like. Um, put yourself in their shoes. I mean, we were talking about tacit and explicit earlier. Um, coming into the HVAC industry, because I'm, I'm only three and a half years into this, four years into this, playing in the HVAC world. Um, it, like I'm like, so what does their business model look like? Um, how do they make money? Uh, how many employees do they have? How does this work? Um, it, you know, it's, it, it, the books of a business all work the same. There's money in and there's money out and there's employees and there's overhead and all those sorts of things. The, 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 that's always the same. The back end of a business is always the same. Um, but the front end of the business is always different. So you want to understand what that looks like and get some real empathy. And I can guarantee you you will be blown away by the stuff that they do. And you will be blown away by the careful thought that is put into all kinds mm -hmm. of things that you're like, you're just like, oh, they're just brute strength. No, they're not. Um, like you've got to be a borderline genius to be a service tech these days. Um, it's really hard. You got to pull up to any house with any piece of equipment um, it, installed poorly, but in a different way in every house um, with different issues and figure out how to diagnose that, get it fixed, get the part changed or get the part ordered, get the thing working again, get paid and get back on the road. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a remarkable skill, having watched people do that. 
Um, so you, you're going to see that. So go do a ride along and, and experience what a day in the life of an HVAC guy is. Um, and actually, three thoughts. So there was, a, I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm sure it's going to be good because Brian's stuff is always good. Um, HVAC School Podcast. Um, he just dropped an episode on technician mental health. This is something right. we need to put some some emphasis on because it's hard. I mean, um, my contracting company did a real number on my mental health. Um, I mean, I came out of that and I decided I never want to have an employee again, ever. Mm. Um, I'll do partnerships, but I don't want to have an employee. Or if I do, I'm going to have an HR department that deals with that because I'm not going to deal with the employee issues personally moving forward. Like it, it, it scarred me. Um, it's it, closing down that company was so hard. I mean, I closed it down by choice, uh, but it was hard. So it is not an easy thing to do. They work really hard. They're very thoughtful about stuff. They're trying, they're trying to figure stuff out. So go see that, go do a ride along. The second big thing is I am reminded of a quote from Simon Sinek, who said, there are two ways to influence people. You can coerce them and you can inspire them. Let's not coerce anyone. Okay. If you intend to coerce, I mean, coercion, it's very effective. We, we know it is. I mean, the whole idea of a con man, um, I mean, it's existed for forever. Um, that's coercion. Sales oftentimes feels like coercion. Um, but long term, it's, it's a Machiavellian strategy. Um, it, it's, it's a short or medium term strategy. Eventually, you end up with a knife in your back. Um, it's it's to, to paraphrase something else, right? It's like, you can coerce some of the contractors some of the time, but you can't coerce all the contractors all the time. Yeah. If you want to get an industry behind you, you, you know, you're not going to do it by flinging incentives at them or, you know, just taking the attitude to them. I, I, I'm, I, I am not a contractor myself, but I bristle when I hear policymakers say, are the contractors ready to take on the challenge? Do they need more education? Do they need more training? Like, dude, they don't, you need more training. Yeah. Like you, the policymaker, need more experience. You need to understand yes. how you can design your, you orient your worldview in a way that you can get the contractors along. These men and women are, are skilled at what they do. Yes, we talked about skill shortage earlier, but that's, it's not an individual thing. It's not like individuals don't have the skill. It's the mm -hmm. industry as a whole is not able to grow at the scale at which we want. But that doesn't mean individuals in there are just slinging boxes together, right? These are extremely talented, smart people who take great pride in their work, uh, who are able to deliver meaning, like meaning and hap who are able to derive meaning out of delivering happiness to homeowners. And now you want to, and you're looking at them with an attitude that says they need, they need to do more work. They yeah. need to go back to school. You they need people. To, you people. <laughs> what do you mean, you people? <laughs> you people need to educate yourself and get and get better trained at what you do so that you can coerce your customers into delivering on the goals that I am prioritizing. That is, yeah. it's not a relationship that is going to sustain itself. You know, it's 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 a it's it's a it's a abusive, toxic relationship, quite frankly. And we, I believe that, you know, it's it, it's. I believe that we need to p turn this around, and and I would ask policymakers and people who are in the policy realm to to spend more time thinking about what it would mean to let HVAC industry lead. And for you to then throw your shoulder at the yoke as a policymaker yes. to help them get to their goals. Because HVAC industry being more successful around metrics like uh, dealing with skill shortage, around metrics like um, turning a, you know, home energy into a service, not a, not a commodity that they can sell, uh, helping them develop a sustainable business model that doesn't suffer whiplash, that is the pathway to, to decarbonization. It's, and it's not going to happen if, if these goals are not, if you don't support the industry in meeting these goals first. Inspire them, don't coerce them. Yeah, and, and develop that, you know, we talked about the church at the kitchen table, right? This is a similar thing. There is a lot of friction between policy, there can be a lot of friction between policymakers and 
people who develop and implement, you know, between HR contracts and policymakers. There's also, it's a fragile relationship because it's not predicated on trust based on history of yes. bad programs that have ruined livelihoods. So yep. it's incumbent upon both parties, I think, to, to come to the table and, 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 and span those boundaries so that we can get to some of these goals that are relevant for all of us. It's, it's not like, again, on behalf of policymakers, I can say it's not like policymakers are cooking up these priorities in, you know, in their homes and they're foisting that upon the world, right? What policymakers are doing are reflecting the priorities of the electorate and reflecting the priorities of communities and saying that, you know, it's not, it's a shared priority to some degree. So all I'm saying is that, you know, is to meet at the church of this, not the kitchen table, but at the church of the picking table, maybe. <laughs> you know, go 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 to do get, do some barbecues together, right? Go have some ride alongs, <laughs> and then develop that uh, relationship of trust. And then, you know, meet let's be creative. Are. Meet them where they are. Let's let's be creative. You know, they, there's you know hundreds of cities around this country. Maybe there's some out there that are willing to take on this call and and develop a program that is centered around HVAC contractors. And, Indeed, yeah, and, and a deal with these four bloom. horsemen. Um, or yeah, these four a, horsemen of these. So I mean, we we need to deal with the skill shortage, the commoditization and commodification issue, dealing with business model whiplash, and then like like you said, that's uh, and I like the idea of thinking about the cultural decline of workmanship, basically being kind of the root cause of the other three. Yeah. So we, we yeah. have a lot of work on our plates, but I mean, it, the, the odds of decarbonizing right now by 2050 of homes in the U S and Canada are 0%. I have <laughs> uh, like, it, it's um, it, it, well, it's, it's dumb and dumber odds. Um, you know, what are the odds between a girl like you and a guy like me? I'm about one in a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. Um, but that is not, this is a pretty serious thing that we're trying to deal with. Um, I mean, it's, it's not just a little bit serious. This is literally the continuation of human civilization that we're right. working with here. Um, and so if we don't take this seriously, like uh, it, it, one of the things my partner likes to say is, do you want to win the argument or do you want to win? <laughs> I want to win. Mm-hmm. Um, I want, I want is... to dominate. I want to crush the industry. <laughs> Um, well, that would be coercion. You're right. But uh, I, I, I want to win against shifting where the climate's going right now, um, at least in the space that we have to control. But this is a pretty big piece. I mean, uh, residential decarbs is a solid 10% of the puzzle. So mm-hmm. this, this is, we, we can't get there without this 10%. Um, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it is a 10% of the decarbonization puzzle, but, you know, like we said earlier, this intersects on a, on a, on a, it's, it's more than just decarbonization too, right? Because we're talking yep. about livelihoods of small business owners in every county yep. in the country, yep. uh, being able to deliver comfortable homes, high performance homes to yep. people, regardless of the circumstances of their household incomes and stuff like that. And you know the age of housing and, and, and the air quality index indoors of uh, tenant housing, there's just so many issues here that are a part of this puzzle once we start looking at this as a, a home energy and, 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 a, and a call to home retrofits, like a national call to home retrofits, rather than a, okay, it's a 10% of decarbonization thing. So that's what, yeah. and, 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 and again, we want to grow the size of HVAC industry and, and, and provide a pathway to a stable middle-class income that doesn't require you to go to a university where you can, live in a community, plant deep roots, develop a business model that gives you, uh, you know, the help, it helps you live the life that you want to live in the community that you yeah. want to live in, provide value to people that you care about, keep them warm, keep them help, healthy, keep them happy. And, and to, and to do, be able to do workmanship and craftsmanship at a pr- production scale. Like these are big, deep, fundamental issues that we are talking about when we talk about HVAC industry. And I think decarbonization is like one piece of that puzzle. Mm-hmm. And I don't wake up every day, I'm being honest and candid now, I don't wake up every day thinking about how to decarbonize the world. I don't, it's not one of my priorities at all. What I do care about well, it's one of, not one of my existential priorities at all. What I do care about is that I want 
uh, people in my community, the, the, the places that I call home, to be a place where people can retire in uh, and, and with their friends and neighbors. And people, I want to create, I want to transform an industry in a way that it doesn't, that it that individuals in that industry can plant their roots and have a long, sustainable life and not have to move to four different countries like I did, right? Like I feel like homeless sometimes in a way because there's no place that I can genuinely call home, no people that I can call my own. And yeah. if I can transform an industry in a way that the men, young kids and, and boys and girls and men and women who are starting their own businesses today can plant their roots in their community and, and do a good job while feeling like they're doing something worthwhile, like that is what I want out of the HVAC industry. And decarbonization is a way to get there. But, mm -hmm. and that's how I view it. And so that's yeah. how I have like sublimated like my own goals to, to enter into this as a, as a decarbonization conversation, right? So that's what I'm asking policymakers to do is if you're leading with decarbonization, if you're coercing, you're losing, yeah. to then sublimate your goals so that you're meeting the industry where it's at. And so that together you can un, 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 untie this Gordian knot. Sorry That's if that was good, a rant. You just got me on my soapbox, man. That was, that I, was beautiful, I'm, I think. I'm, I'm tired of this. I, I, I don't know. I don't care if I come across as emotional, but like, what the heck are we doing here? Right? How many more case studies do you need? How many more pilot programs do you need? How much more data do you need to collect? So my, my dad had, uh, uh, he, he created a bunch of commandments after the 10, the 10 commandments of the Bible. And the 13th commandment was thou shalt not screw around. And I feel like we have been screwing around yep. with efficiency and decarbonization and um, contractor lives in the policy world as well. Um, in public health, like this is going to have massive public health changes. So we can affect indoor and outdoor air quality to a huge degree. I mean, the 3H program that I helped propose, um, the hybrid heat homes program, um, it, it had a 10x payback is what the, it modeled out as, but seven of those 10 times were health benefits. Um, fewer kids landing in the hospital for asthma is, is a big, big deal. Um, damp buildings have been causally connected to childhood asthma since 2015. So it's not an association, it's causation. Um, and I mean, I know this, my, my mom is very uh, sensitive to chemicals and moisture and mold um, and just a, a bunch of things. Um, and it was from living in a damp house. So I walked into this crazy mansion that my dad had. It was 19,000 square feet and it was a basket case. Um, and the back part was built in the sixties and I walk in and I just got a wave of mold hitting me in the face. And that made my mom sensitive. So about a third of people are sensitive to mold and you're okay until you get triggered. And once you get triggered, you can never be untriggered. So this is, you know, what, one of the pieces of expertise I've had to develop um, while trying to figure out this path. Um, so there's a lot of kids out there that are living in damp homes with damp <laughs> basements, getting sick. And um, a good electric system, I mean, we call it badass HVAC, that does a really good job with moisture in a house. We can make that kid better by providing him a better place to live. And then outside, there's not going to be as much stuff being burned. So there won't be as much garbage in the air. So if we want to talk about equity and being good to low and moderate income people, this is a really wonderful path. Um, so if, if, if Abby and I can inspire the people that are listening to this, uh, that this is such a better path forward in general, but it only works if we worship the church at the kitchen table and we make the lives of contractors and the lives of their homeowner uh, clients better. Everyone needs to have an experience that is so good that they go out and talk to others about it mm -hmm. because then we don't have to market it. And if we don't have to spend money on marketing and it grows anyway, if we can market, that makes it grow faster. But it needs to naturally, without any marketing, have that geometric curve going up. 
Um, and the only thing that we want to do is potentially make that geometric curve go up even faster. So if what we are doing is not doing that, we are hurting people. Yeah. What's the point of all of this? Yeah, it's pointless. Right? So th and don't just take your salary, um, like do something that's good with it. And so that's the thing, right? Like when what you're articulating is a way where you're saying that this is what I, this is how I found myself in this sort of decarbonization, home electrification, whatever piece is that these are my values. And, and so I'm going to get to those values through this path. And what I am worried about is, is, is people turning it the other way around because I, you see a lot of chatter online about, uh, you know, decarbonization is also a, a healthcare policy. Decarbonization is also a child poverty policy. Decarbonization is also this and that policy. And there's merits to that because it's built on the strength of stories and narratives like yours but you're saying that I value these things. It gives me joy to help elevate and improve health outcomes for this one individual. Therefore, I'm going to use home electrification, decarbonization, all of these goals to get to that one goal. But there is a real danger in collecting individual stories like this and framing a meta narrative around it because then that becomes a forefront on the culture war. Yep. Now you've tied decarbonization to these, these fundamental schisms and cleavages that we're having in our yeah. discourse now in our broader culture where like you know yeah i mean yeah, yeah, i don't want to get into the details of that right around what's the, what's right of center what's left of center what's justice and what's not just what equity and not equity like we don't have to once you form these like large and that's the problem with like with with taking these individual stories and making them top down if you if we understand the world through that simple narrative that in order to do decarbonization, you need to prioritize health of kids. You need to prioritize, you need to, you need to. If you're telling people that, yeah, if you're hanging all these baggages to decarbonization, then you're narrowing the willingness and interest and in, in the kind of people who want to be involved in, your, in, in the goals that we commonly share. So what you and I are describing now is for individuals, to identify whatever goals they want to identify and then sublimate them to, to working with the HVAC, working with HVAC contractors and frontline workers that end of the day, it's not, I, I, in my day job, I'm not going to go start caulking and sealing windows. I'm not going to start ripping out furnaces and putting in heat pumps. I need folks like HVAC 2.0 contracts to be able to do that. So it's incumbent upon me to, to find ways that I can support them uh, than rather than you know, uh, uh, and and support them not just through like you know not just by going into those communities and telling them a good job, but like supporting them through my own day job, which I'm focused on doing. Mm -hmm. But that but uh, build that cultural bridge so that we both understand each other and are working towards a common purpose. Amen, Abi. <laughs> this, this 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 needs to be done for the the, the good of everyone. Um, and to a large degree, what this looks like is leveraging the tool of capitalism for good. Because we accidentally, inadvertently, um, have caused a problem with capitalism by burning so much stuff. But there's no reason that if we aren't careful in creating business models that are better than what exists currently, that naturally decarbonize that we can't use the same tool that got us in this mess to dig it back out. I mean, it's, I guess it's a shovel. So we, we already dug the hole. Let's get out of the hole and start shoveling it back in. Um, right. So when you're, when you're talking about, you know, using the capitalism for good, like, you know, I want people to understand this properly. What we're not, we're not getting into debates of like capitalism versus socialism and all this sort of thing. What we're saying is that the pathway towards decarbonization rests on contractors being able to develop sustainable long-term business models and being able to grow. And if, yes. and if you're not able to do that, then you'll not be successful. And again, by grow, I don't simply mean so that they can start making 10 X, 20 X return on their investment and not that, but that end of the day, these men and women, they care about their jobs. They find their lives meaningful and, and, and they want the industry to grow. I have never met any other industry where it's 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 so 
refreshing for me to speak to contractors and ask them about their, their job and their work. And they will often say, my industry, our industry needs to do this. Our industry needs to do that. I've never heard in other sectors, people talk about that. I think a lot of contractors take a collective responsibility for the industry. They want the industry mm-hmm. to grow. They want to lead the industry. Some of them want to lead the industry by example. Some of them want to show what, how to develop these business models that you're talking about, right? And then how to show a different alternative path. Oftentimes, most HVAC companies are, are kind of, I mean, they're roughly the same. They're constructed the same way. They work on the same business models, but there are some out there that are interested and willing to, to lead by example and show a different way. And I think that it's incumbent upon policymakers to identify who those businesses are, see what makes them tick and, and help support them and help the industry in pivoting towards these successful business models. Um, and, and that's what you mean by, you know, by, by using capitalism for good is that we already have a mechanism for replacing HVAC system. It, we've got yeah. 400,000, you know, how many or hundreds of thousands of contractors around the country we need to support them so that they can build a more successful business model. That's, that's what you mean, right? About yeah, yeah, we're just we're, we're we're going to use the the tool in a slightly different way, uh, yeah. but it's still doing it. But uh, what we're trying to avoid is, I mean, if you want to talk about sustainability, losing money isn't sustainable. You can only grow, you can only do good things if you make money. Yep. Um, so we need to be able to structure it for that. And ideally, whatever business models we come up with are enough better than what currently exists, that it acts like kudzu. Um, it, it acts like an invasive species and takes it over, only it's, it, it, it's, it's a good invasive. Um, but that, that needs to be done by inspiring people, not by coercing them. Got it. So... The four horsemen of the HVAC ellipse. Sounds like layering on decarbonization might present a significant challenges, but HVAC 2.0 is working on a pathway to help contractors deal with those four challenges while also layering decarbonization on top of that. That is correct. And, and are, is it and are you are you we, because I'm wearing the extra 2.0 t-shirt right now. And if you have to say, by the way, Nate and I here are, on, are here on a personal capacity. Uh, we're running this off the side of our desk. So it, does, it doesn't represent our employees or employers or my family or, you know, my country or my culture, right? This is just as shooting off the uh, you know, top of our head. But HVAC 2.0, correct me if I'm wrong, is right now the largest network of contractors in the country that's doing home electrification at scale. Yep. And it's pretty darn small. So that isn't saying much. <laughs> so what is it? 50, 70 contracts or 50 contractors? Um, well, there's, members. there's a, it, m- members, there's 120. Uh, yep. Active is more like 30. Yep. And so this is, so everyone, I, I may be biased because I'm wearing the HVAC 2.0 t-shirt, but I think HVAC 2.0 is something to watch for because it's it has shown the only viable pathway so far for the industry confronting these four challenges and layering on decarbonization, decarbonization on top of that. So how can people follow HVAC 2.0? Or what, um, you know what, let's do that in the diff- next episode. We'll do a yeah, call to action, episode. right? Like yeah. we've talked about what HVAC 2.0 does. We have very specific, ad, like small things you can do to help uh, the HVAC industry grow and meet decarbonization goals. I've got some suggestions or calls to actions that I have from homeowners, from policymakers, from politicians, from contractors, from industry, from uh, academia, a whole nine yards. So maybe in the next episode, we can we can very quickly talk about the pathway that HVAC 2.0 has laid out with these mm-hmm. you know uh, four horsemen of the HVAC ellipse, and then <laughs> the more I say the word, <laughs> I love it. HVAC ellipse, I got it, I got it. Um, um, uh, and then we can, we have very specific asks from policymakers on how they can do better to support the industry so we can get to our goals, decarbonization goals. 
I'll see you next time then, Abby. We'll talk about that. See you, Nate.